Praise God. Let's stand. Are you guys sleeping? We're about to worship our God. So praise God. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of God. Amen. Can you hear me?
chapter 4 <coughs> and verse 14. <laughs> Esther chapter 4 and verse 14. <coughs> Yours will probably be a little bit different because <coughs> I am reading from kind of an obscure translation, uh, the Christian Standard Bible. Because there's a key word in here, the way it's translated, so, you know, I wanted to bring that one point across. But it's the same meaning, no matter where you read it from. Esther, Esther chapter 4, verse 14 says, If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows, perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Your royal position for such a time as this. My title today is Perfectly Positioned. And let's pray one more time. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for all your grace, for all your blessings, Lord, for everything that you have poured out on us in abundance. Lord, how you lead and guide our lives, Lord. And I pray today that we just be able to see your hand on our lives, Lord. Or perhaps we're wondering where you are or where you've been during this time, Lord. I pray you would answer some of those questions today. God, and help us to see how you have perfectly positioned us, Lord, for your purpose to be accomplished in our lives, Lord. Continue to speak to us, Lord, as the word goes forth. And let us respond to it with gladness, Lord, and with with just honoring what you have asked us to do. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can be seated if you would like. How many chess players do we have in the room? Does anybody like a game of chess? Okay, all right. We've got a few. Perfect. All right. Not, not too, I'm surprised there's not a few more. No chess hands, eh? Except for the ones that raise their hands. Well, you'll know... Anyway, the, the, the chess players will know, but I think everybody has probably a basic idea about how each piece can only move in a specific way. So the ones that I could find from the box of games back there, I couldn't even find all the pieces, but I'm sure they're there somewhere. But you've got the knight that can only move in the L shape. You've got the, the rook that can only move in the straight line. You've got the bishop that can only move on the diagonal. You've got, I think this is a queen, but I'm not sure it could be a king. We're gonna say it's a queen. Can move anywhere, basically, within a, a line in any direction. Or if it was a king, you can all do the same, but only one square at a time. I don't know if that's, is that a king or a queen? It's the king, okay, so it's the king. I've got no idea. And then you've got the pawn, and I know I've missed a few. But this, you might say, is the most limited of them all. For a pawn, and there's some exceptions, so, so don't come after me, but the pawn typically can only move one square forward at a time, or if it's taking another player, maybe on the diagonal. But it's a one square at a time piece. It can't move backwards. It can only go forwards, unless it gets all the way to the end. Of, you know, that's a different story. But you might see it as the most limited piece on the board. However, even a pawn can be used to win the game if it is perfectly positioned. Chess players will know that you kind of have to think several moves ahead in order to be truly successful. Great chess players, they can, they kind of can picture ahead what they're going to do, what the other person is likely to do, where they are likely to move their pieces. And so they will position pieces now for moves that are much further on down the line. And even that pawn, like I said, if it gets to the end of the board, if it's positioned in the right place, it is even able to be transformed into a king or to a qu queen, whatever, to the, the powerful one. See? I'm <coughs> <coughs> but this is my question for you today. What would happen if we allowed God to position us where he saw fit? Because in our thinking, to be called a pawn or to be considered a pawn is somewhat of a negative thing. If I was to say I'm somebody's pawn, it means they're taking advantage of me, is what we would usually mean that as. It's being used or even manipulated. But you see, when we're talking about God, he, for what? He doesn't abuse. He doesn't force. But if we will yield to him, yes, he does want to use us. And every Christian, every believer should have a deep desire to be used by God. Why? Because we owe him everything. Amen. Because we've experienced his greatness and his grace. And why would we not want him to use us?
to show others, to bring glory to him. We should have that deep desire, every single one of us. Lord, whatever you've got to do to me, use me. Lord, put me where you want. I don't care about that. I don't care where I am on the board. I don't care, you know, what piece I am. But Lord, just place me where you want me to be so that I can be used by you. That should be the passion and the desire of each one of our hearts. But in order for him to use us, we must allow him to position us. You see, as a pawn, we cannot see the whole board, but the player can. All right, you get where I'm going with that. God can see so much further, so much more than we can. And so we read today from the book of Esther. And Esther has such an incredible story. Mm -hmm. Esther lived in Persia around 480 BC. Mm -hmm. The Persian queen had been deposed, kicked out of her role, mm -hmm. due to an act of defiance to the king's drunken command to come and display her beauty to his equally drunken guests. And so she was put off, she was torn, you know, her position torn away from her. And the kingdom's search for a new queen began. And this is where Esther comes in, or Hadassah as she was known um, in the Jewish language. Now Esther, when it's told, is often told as a romance. But I don't believe that that was the case. If you understand the culture and what's going on here, it is not a romantic story. In fact, it is more like a tragedy that God turns around and uses for good. Mm -hmm. See, Esther didn't have easy. Esther didn't just come and volunteer and, yeah, I'll participate in this beauty contest. Oh, no, now I'm queen. You know, it didn't work like that. Mm -hmm. Her people, the Jewish people, they were exiles in a strange land. They were the minorities. Mm -hmm. They were not always well respected. Basically, every trauma that you can think of, Esther experienced it. Racism? <clears throat> yeah, you guarantee mm -hmm. she experienced that. Mm -hmm. You know, every custom, everything that they did was suspicious to the Persian people. Esther herself was an orphan. Her parents had been killed. We don't know the story behind that, but her parents had been killed, and she had no, no parents left. She had been raised by her cousin, who was 15 years older than her. Then, as the search for a queen is going on, the soldiers began going to every village and every town or wherever, and they began looking for every young, unmarried virgin girl that they can find mm -hmm. that has a beautiful face. Mm -hmm. It was not a volunteering type of thing. It was not, hey, who wants to be queen? Mm -hmm. No, it was, hey, you, come on. Get in the, get in the chariot. We're going to the palace. Mm -hmm. It was by force. Likely, she was basically kidnapped. She had no choice in the matter. We don't know her story. She was likely an early young teenager at the time. Now they did marry young at that time, but we don't know, you know, her story. Maybe, maybe she was just, you know, just still focused on, you know, the things that girls are focused on. She didn't want to be queen. Maybe, maybe there was be a betrothal of her own. Maybe there was a man that she was in love with, that she thought that she was going to marry someday and have children, and they were going to live this nice Jewish life. Well, no, no, she wasn't. Mm -hmm. See, we, it wasn't this, this fairy tale type thing, but it was a situation that she would not have chosen for herself. She was taken, Josephus, a historian, tells us, along with four, um, 400 other women into the royal custody, the final selected of the virgins. Mm -hmm. Now, entering into the palace may have been exciting, more likely a little bit fearful, intimidating, but she was entering a place, an environment that was opposed to her very identity. There is a reason why her cousin Mordecai told her, don't tell anybody who you are. Do not tell them that you are a Jew. It wasn't because he was ashamed. It wasn't because he was didn't want anybody to know about the God she served. He was fearful for her life if she was not careful. And so this was an environment that was likely hostile. I'm not going crazy, right? No. <laughs> it's a laptop playing. Is it like playing ads or something on its own? No, it's not. How? <laughs> I've got no idea. All right. <laughs> So weird. 
Okay, all right. <laughs> I got no idea. I don't know how to fix it. Uh, we'll just turn. I don't know. I don't know how to fix it. Um, just turn it off, I guess. Yeah. It's all through there. Just turn it off and I'll just do the left <laughs> All right, we got it. Nope. You guys can hear me okay, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> We're not promoting that kind of music. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it was Christian. All right. We're going to continue on with the story. But this was a foreign environment. This was a hostile environment that she was walking into. And if you know anything about young teenage girls, it probably wasn't the most uplifting environment either. Mm -hmm. Not to be stereotypical, uh, but I have watched enough sea dramas to know that in those uh, harems and stuff, there's a lot of uh, drama. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, anyway, don't judge me for that. But, you know, they, they, you get all of these teenage girls together, and the thing is, is all of them want to be queen. Mm -hmm. Even Esther, all of them want to be queen. Why? Not because it's glamorous. Mm -hmm. Not because, oh, you know, that's great. Why? Because it's better than the alternative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to do everything that they can do to become queen. And sometimes girls will stop at nothing. I can say that because I am one, but uh, women can be brutal. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but you see this, this thing, it, this was not, I'm just trying to get the reality of the situation across to you. The things that she would have faced from the teenage drama to the fear for her life to the having to hide who she was. All of these things seem to be against her. Mm -hmm. And the worst Probably the worst part of it is every young girl would be forced to spend one night with the 40-year-old king. Every single one of them. And afterwards, would they be released? No. They would become, they would be sent to, to become concubines, which basically means that they would be slaves or property of the king to do with as he saw fit. No status, no power, no protection. That was, that was it. Probably likely never to be able to truly uh, be with their family again and those connections. So there was no escaping for Esther. Mm -hmm. No matter what, she was either going to be queen, stuck in this environment, or she was going to be with the concubines and her fate was no better. Mm -hmm. Only if the king took a liking to one of them could they have just a little bit better of a life. Mm -hmm. And so one by one, they were led away. And they did not return. They would have been transferred to another building after. And in all of this, Esther is one of only two books in the Bible where the name of God is not mentioned. Mm -hmm. You will not find the word God. You will not find his name, Elohim, that he was known by. You will not find a mention of it. Mm -hmm. In fact, from the first reading, it almost seems that he's not even involved in the story. Mm -hmm. It's just happening. Mm -hmm. It's just what life was for Esther and for her situation. But yet, when we read it through the eyes of faith, we know and we can see God's work all throughout it, charting the course of events. Everything that Esther had endured, being in exile, having her parents taken away from her at a young age, uh, being forced into marrying this 40-year-old guy that she's never met, you know, all of these things, there was a purpose and a plan in all of it. God was positioning her for something that she could not see yet. So where was God in Esther's story? Mm -hmm. Well, his providence was at work the whole way through. Mm -hmm. Because out of all the virgins in Persia, Esther was beautiful enough to be picked. Out of all the beautiful women mm -hmm. that were taken to the palace, this one Jewish girl, she wasn't even Persian. By the way, Persian kings were not supposed to marry outside of 20 royal families. Mm -hmm. so I, don't know, I don't know how they worked the law in this case. But she was chosen. The outsider, mm. the one that shouldn't have been, the one that mm. had no family history, mm. no family lineage. Amen. She Amen. was the one chosen yes. and placed Thank you, Lord. somewhere she probably would not never have chosen to be. But God had a plan. Amen. Esther received the favor of the king and was selected to be queen. We would think at that point, again, in our maybe thinking, it, uh, if we thought of this like a fairy tale, we'd be like, oh, there's the happy ending. She became queen. No, that wasn't the happy ending. Mm -hmm. She still had very little power or security. We find she couldn't even initiate contact with the king. She was just there for when he wanted to call her. Mm -hmm. The king could be temperamental. 
the previous queen had had her position, even though she was queen, you know, that didn't protect her. So maybe Esther thought, as long as I keep my head down, as long as I'm obedient, as long as I don't reveal who I am, at least I can enjoy the luxury of the palace and I'll be okay. But even that didn't last, because outside the walls of her quarters, high up individuals, Haman, were pawning her destruction. Mm -hmm. Haman convinced the king, issue an order to kill all of the Jews in Persia. They don't have Persia's interests at heart. They're a danger, we need to kill them. Now we know he had some other motives for that, because he uh, had some personal beef with Mordecai, mm -hmm. Esther's cousin, who would not bow to him. But regardless, this order goes out, and word comes to Esther that her cousin is sitting at the gate in sackcloth and ashes. Mm -hmm. Esther did not hear from this. You know, she did not hear of this order, this proclamation. She was sheltered and disconnected. All she knew is that Mordecai is mourning. Mm -hmm. Mordecai sitting there, he's torn his clothes, he's poured ash, these things, these universal signs of mourning. And her first response is to send him clothes. Mm -hmm. I, I just kind of get a kick out of that. Mm -hmm. All the Jews are going to be destroyed, and Esther thinks, well, I'll send him some new clothes. <laughs> That's not going to work. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be That's enough. Right. Mordecai mm -hmm. had to give Esther a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. Yes, we see Esther as somewhat of a hero, a heroine in the story. But Mordecai, her cousin, really had to send her a wake-up call. Esther, you think you're okay. You think you're secure in your palace and your position that you didn't even want to be in, but now you're there and you think that's going to protect you? Your life, your people are in danger. Mm -hmm. He said, sure, of course, I'm paraphrasing, of course we have faith. Our people are going to be delivered. We know God's hand is upon the Jewish people and has been throughout the Old Testament. We see that that he preserved them time and time again. So Mordecai, he had faith in that. I know that we're going to be okay, but Esther, do you think that if you sit and do nothing, that you are safe? God will preserve his people, his lineage, but your safety, your salvation may depend upon your actions at this moment. Mm -hmm. And in the verse that we read, for, it might be that you have come to the royal position for such a time as this. He reminds her that she has likely been positioned where she is for this exact moment. Mm -hmm. Esther's first instinct was not courage. Mm -hmm. She was courageous, but that was not her first in instinct, but fear. After all, if she was to appear uninvited before the king, mm -hmm. now by this time she'd probably gotten to know the king a little bit. She probably knew his moods and, you know, all the his personality a little bit by now. And to appear before him uninvited would mean unless he happened to be in a good mood that day. And then he could choose to pardon her by raising his scepter. But however, she was obedient to, to her cousin's directions. He said, well, let's have everybody fast and pray. And if I perish, I perish. The end of the story is that Esther was successful. After prayer and fasting, she went before the king. The king had mercy on her, thank God. And she asked for his intervention. The Jews were given the right to defend themselves. Haman, who had started the whole thing, was hanged. And Mordecai was placed in a position of honor. Esther was now free to be herself, to be the person of God that she had been destined to be, the, the Jew, the Israelite. She could be that without fear now. So we might say at that point, finally, she got her happy ending. But along the way, Esther had to be reminded that her current position was not by chance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God had placed her there for That's a right. reason. That's right. She needed that wake-up call, that it wasn't just, you know, life. And sometimes we, as the church, <coughs> we need a wake-up call, too. That's right. Amen. Because we live in a world that is in great danger. Mm -hmm. I'm not a conspiracy theorist or doomsayers. I'm not saying it because of any of those things. Mm -hmm. But I am saying it because the Lord is going to come back. Mm -hmm. And those that are not washed in his blood, those that have not repented of their sins, but baptized in mm -hmm. Jesus' name yeah. and filled with the yeah. Holy Ghost. Yeah. I fear for them because their destination, mm -hmm. according to the word of God, mm -hmm. is eternal darkness yeah. and hellfire. Our world is in danger. Yes. And as the people of God, if that doesn't bother us, yes, Lord. Yes. if we think we can sit back where God has placed us and 
be okay with that, mm -hmm. then there's something wrong with us. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. God has ordained our lives. He's ordered our steps, mm -hmm. both the good and the bad. He's had our hand mm -hmm. on us through, through it all, and he's brought us to where we are. But don't forget that where you are, God has a purpose for you. Amen. 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 We can't be so focused on self-preservation and all of those things that we neglect what God wants to do. God will have his revival. Yes. Yes. In the last days, God will pour out his spirit. Yes. Upon all
my life over to God. You know, all of these different things that we can have. And Paul was saying, you know, don't try to change your situation and then serve God. Serve God Amen. where Amen. you are. You might feel like you're in a bad position, but God may be saying, I have you right where I want you because I've got something great for you right here in the slave quarters. The sooner that we can relinquish control, the better. The sooner that we can say, Lord, it's up to you. It's your way, the better. One of my favorite verses, and I, I probably use it a lot because I love it. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. We have an idea of what would happen, what should happen. We have our plans. Thank God for planning because it's important. But what if God has other plans? Young people, when you're planning your life, allow God to position you where he wants you to be. Because we can have our, our own mind. I've been there not too long ago. You know, we can have our own plans of what we want to do and where we want to be, and all those things are good. But you might say, well, I have to go to this uni because it's the one that's good for my career. But what if there's no apostolic church there? Is it worth your soul? Oh, I have to take this job that's going to require me on work on Sundays. Position yourself where God wants you to be, and he'll take care of you.
random. I, you know, I was running a little late, and that's why this happened. Might be just be sensitive to the fact that God may have a work for you there. Mm -hmm. That you just thought it was whatever. Sometimes the delay that we complain about mm -hmm. places us exactly where God wants us to be. The situation we just want to be out of, God has a purpose for us there. My last verse. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It's God who does the work. But will we yield to him and will we recognize the opportunities? Brother Clay, if you want to get ready and come back to the music, that would be great. So let me just challenge you today. Maybe, I don't know, maybe some of us need to change our perspective a little bit. Because you can feel sometimes just like the pawn on the chessboard, and it's like somebody else is moving them. You know, you just, all these responsibilities and all these things that just are life, and it's like, okay, oh, we're moving, oh, okay, we're moving there, all right, you know. Powerless and tossed about just wherever life happens to throw us. Remember, there's a plan, there's a purpose that position for such a time as this. What is it that's preparing you? What is your position today? Unpleasant situation at work? Turmoil in your family? A new environment or season that just is so full of unknowns? A season of waiting? I know a little bit about that one. Helplessness? Maybe it's more internal where you just feel like there's something and you don't even know what it is, but there's something. Maybe it's the spirit that's drawing you you're unsure of what it all means. You want to put that last slide up, Dylan. This is what I want you to pray today. Yeah, well, you can pray whatever you want, but just help direct you. Lord, think about some of those things going on in your life. Lord, are you using these things that maybe I'm complaining about to position me exactly where you want me to be? Because if so, I don't want to fight again. Lord, I surrender my ways and plans to you, Lord. Direct my paths. And Lord, how can I bring glory and fulfill your purpose right where I am? You don't have to wait for something big to happen or for all the right pieces to fall in place. Yes, there's a timing and there's a season, but make sure it's God's timing and season and not just our own ideas. Because God puts us in places Sometimes we don't want to be. And we don't understand why we're there. But the Lord may call us, give us that wake-up call to look around and to see the needs around us and say, I'll put you here for such a time as this. You are perfectly positioned. Why don't we stand? You are welcome to come up to the front and just find a place to seek the Lord. Find a place to talk to Him about some of these things. Maybe some of those things that you just don't understand. But if we can surrender them to him and say, Lord, I don't have to understand. But Lord, I'm going to trust in your plan. Help me to see your purpose for this season. Hallelujah. Why don't we come? Why don't we pray, church? Lord Jesus.